thank everybody for joining us tonight. The weather's a little dicey, but uh, not everybody's here. So I thought that we would start with a question. Um, what are people's expectations of creative works by people of Chinese descent? And the general public's perception, uh, expectations, will certainly be that things are maybe in traditional culture or some representation of it. Um, and uh, they, me, their expectations are deeply rooted in traditional culture or some representation of it. And contemporary artists from, or con from contemporary artists from China, uh, people will probably appreciate uh, a little bit of political or social commentary. Uh, about two years ago, the Met held its first major contemporary Chinese art show and it examined how contemporary Chinese artists interpret traditional techniques, themes, and imagery. And anecdotally, some visitors, including Chinese people, deemed them to be strange or not Chinese. At the Met this year, designers in the Through the Looking Glass Fashion Exhibition also inter interpreted the so called Chinese image. And many of these designers magnified it into what was conceded or disclaimed as a fantasy. And this exhibition was the most, the museum's most attended ever. But the idea of this panel discussion actually began with a conversation I had with Isabel Chant from Kleinstein Gallery. And we, we were interested in looking at how the Chinese image or Chinese myths was represented given how the fashion show really played into people's expectations of the Chinese aesthetic. Um, as you can imagine, uh, there's a very wide variety of Chinese art, Chinese artists, as the walls on the gallery here show and the uh, exhibition calendar that Beyond Chinatown maintains. There is a lot happening with uh, a lot of different people from a lot of different Chinese backgrounds uh, working in the field of arts. So to help us explore these topics, uh, we're joined by four panelists artists and curators who work in different areas related to uh, contemporary Chinese arts. First, we have uh, Zhang Hongzhou, second from the left. Uh, he was born in China in 1943, and he has lived in the U.S. since 1982. From the mid-80s to the mid-90s, Zhang Hongzhou created paintings, sculptures, and mixed media installations utilizing Mao's image to express his ideas about communist China and the Cultural Revolution. In the last decade, Zhang's works have evolved to question complex relationships between traditions of old China and contemporary rest, as seen in large scale Sansui paintings and other works. His most recent works focus on the relationship between nature and the human condition. From October 18th through February 28th, the Queen's Museum is holding a retrospective of his works. Bob Lee is the executive director and curator of Asian American Art Center participating in its founding in 1974 and the Asian American Arts Alliance in 1983. Exhibiting contemporary artists in 1983, he developed the AAAC Artist Archive, embodying many of whom were exhibited at the AAAC. That's a lot of things. Uh, the archive currently includes 1,600 artists from 1945 to the present, and its digital platform, artsasianamerica.org, makes accessible the beginnings of a visual history of the Asian American creative presence in the United States. Many well-known artists today are exhibited by me at, uh, at AAC early in their career, such as Xi Ding, uh, Hu Wenbang, Ai Weiwei, Tim Kong Si, Marlon Wong, and Zhang Hengzhi. Felice Thomas, at the end, uh, has worked in the field of contemporary Chinese art since 2001 after living two years in rural, rural Hubei province, China. She was the managing edit, uh, director of Ethan Cohen Fine Arts, the gal oldest gallery in the United States that specialized in avant-garde Chinese arts. She was the founding director of AW Asia in New York, a private organization that exclusively promotes the field of contemporary Chinese art. She earned her master's in East Asian studies from Columbia University and is currently a PhD candidate in art theory and philosophy with the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. She has published articles on contemporary Chinese art in various journals. And to my left is Samson Young. He is a Hong Kong-based interdisciplinary artist originally trained in music composition. He is the inaugural winner of the Art Basel BMW Art Journey, Journey Award in 2015 and was named the Artist of the Year in Media Art 
by the Hong Kong Arts Development Council in 2013. He's been very active with nearly a dozen recent exhibitions and projects in Asia, Europe, and the United States. His multimedia exhibition, Pastoral Music in a Live Performance Nocturne, can be seen at the e Gallery in Soho through December 20th. So, uh, as you can see, we have a panel here that is very broad and broad. And I thought that we would start the conversation with Lisa. Um, her work in contemporary Chinese art will probably um, give people the strongest association with uh, the idea of what Chinese art is. So, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, we Well, first of all, I'd like to thank East Coast staff for welcoming us this evening. It's a pleasure to be here with these interesting minds, yourselves as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your question. I would like to say that it has been an honor to be involved in the conversation that is contemporary Chinese art. If we adhere to the timeline proposed by Wu Hong, one of the foremost thinkers in this field. It's 76 forward that we understand contemporary Chinese art. I was born in 76, so it's my entire life that the development of this field has taken place, and it has been an extraordinary thing to witness the emergence of a very powerful market. I will say that my involvement has been very much on the commercial side of things. In fact, I met John Hong two years ago when I was working at Ethan Cohen Fine Arts. So there has been an evolution, certainly, uh, as far as the market is concerned. But really, I believe the thing that we're all doing here is engaging a theoretical and cultural and philosophical side the art itself. China, as we know, has this extraordinary legacy, 5,000 year legacy of art production. So we're on the latest end of that. It's the wave. We find ourselves at the crest of the wave right now. So I don't want to say too much more about my own experience working in, in the commercial end of things, but also representing contemporary Chinese art to the West through our organization here in New York, but really it's a thrill to understand what we're all doing here as a community involved in this shared interest and passion for China. Now, you work very closely with artists from China. Um, what is it that you're presenting? Is it uh, artists from China, people that have lived in China, and maybe you explain a little bit more about uh, who you work with? Thank you. As I mentioned, and as Andrew mentioned, I did manage Ethan Cohen Fine Arts, and Ethan Cohen, being a gallerist, represents contemporary Chinese artists to the West. John Hong Du and a number of other significant artists that I got to know thanks to Ethan and his incredible legacy. His family has been involved with contemporary Chinese art since the, since the beginning. Um, that's a whole conversation for another day. I must be candid about what I do now. I work for a major collector of contemporary Chinese art who has investment interests in the field and did a lot of aggressive buying early on when the buying was good. Went straight into the studios of the top tier market darlings and was able to secure some outstanding work years ago. We founded an organization, AW Asia, that has been devoted to promoting that work in the West. So I always want to be clear about that agenda, although it's not my agenda, I do work for a major collector who has had a, a serious investment, a passion for the investment in the contemporary Chinese art scene. That has afforded me an amazing opportunity to further my own respect and understanding and admiration 
for the work of those artists. But the work that is in the AW Asia collection is, as we know, the work of artists such as Wang Guangyi, Xu Bing, Guenda, Zhang Fangzhi, Zhang Xiaogang. So perhaps we can explore the, the kinds of differences that occur in the we can talk the, about very, the various levels of the, <coughs> the field, as it were. Mm -hmm. so we can talk about it in a little bit of lecture and how it was presented and presented um, by one of the individual's perceptions. So I'm also, you are what some people may consider to be a Chinese artist, but uh, you said that your art doesn't represent China or uh, the Chinese culture necessarily. Uh, but they, a lot of the works can be very strong Chinese imagery, uh, either from uh, the works with Fei <coughs> as a center figure and uh, Chinese uh, landscapes that have been uh, drawn in, in European painting style. Uh, tell us about what you present in your art. I only have had some personal uh, experience. Uh, this is related to your question to, the, to this subject matter of this year, but uh, also very personal. Um, I came here in 1982, how are they adult, no longer as a teenager. And uh, when I came here, I had, I had kind of attitude, I thought I will forget everything that happened in China. All my life in China was nightmare. So uh, I came here, it's a new opportunity. The new land, the new everything, the new, new culture, new environment. So I just started my new life, doing my new art. But actually, uh, mentally, psychologically, your Chinese root also there. Uh, especially now, after during and after 1959, uh, the Tiananmen student movement, and uh, eventually now. Crushed down by the government, by the, the government tank. <clears throat> uh, certainly, I find myself still very, very Chinese. I was going to look on TV, watching all the program, uh, documentary, you know, I take so many, many you know, cassettes myself. Uh, uh, I thought that, no, uh, I'm really concerned about what happened in China. So, this kind of situation changed my attitude to. To make me you know, back to my, I can kind of call it root of my, um, uh, my background. But still, you know, for the last uh, 30, well, 33 years in this country, uh, I participated in so many, many uh, panel discussion talk, uh, just like that today. People talk about, talk about the same uh, issue, about Chinese needs. Talk about the same, same uh, uh, subject matter. Uh, even the questions are the same here about mm -hmm. how to represent the Chinese culture. Uh, uh, even for this panel, when I got uh, the invitation, I didn't really interested to participate. <laughs> I thought that this, this is like a Chinese word, like a Lao Shen Chang Tai, like a kind of like a shit. It's kind of non stop discussion, it's non stop search. But eventually, I find that com compared with uh, my black beer and compared with uh, all my uh, friends from other cultures, uh, I want to see that to continue search the meaning of Chinese is the meaning of Chinese. I mean, this is non-stop. But uh, through this kind of discussion, through this kind of non-stop search, we learn something. So that's important. Let's just have like people talk about what's art. There's no, no standard answer. But we still talk about art. What's the art? Since this kind of this process of the talking, you now asking and talking, we learn that. So that's why I'm, I'm still here. I'm still on to you now tell you my experience. More importantly, on on here, other people's talk. Mm -hmm. uh, your your experience is very personal. It comes from a very specific. Period of Chinese history. Um, now, Samson, your, your work also has dealt with the Chinese culture and 
history of Hong Kong. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you present what you want to present? Um, well, I, I don't know if I have actually um, consciously tried to deal with chinese in my work. Um, I think we should be clear about one thing, which is that um, sort of being Chinese is one thing, but sort of representing, or the act of representing chinese that's sort of, so so that, that's like either an imposition or a desire, which one might or might not have. So, um, um, and, and you know, one condition was necessarily eaten to another. And I think, me personally, I'm just always very um, sensitive to the environment that I'm in and, and try to be responsive. I think there was a time when I, um, especially earlier when I was making stuff that, that, that has a lot to do with, say, for example, video games. I, like, there was a period when I really rejected identity performance. Um, but now I see it differently, I suppose. I, I have a more, I have an abstracted distance to it, but uh, I don't insist it. Um, but I see how that could also potentially, for some artists, be a very fertile place to do a number of things to stage your resistance or to, to perform an identity to whatever. And so, um, yeah, I want to go back to just the point um, that, that I um, circulated and, and that I, I emailed you about um, in our email discussion, which is that I think the, the question of Chineseness is not what it is, but like, who is it for? Who needs it? And, um, and, and it's not a bad judgment, it's not to say that you know, one is, when one is performing it, then you know, it's a question of being uh, disingenuous. Right? So, yeah, the question of why is more important than what that counts. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to be a three part uh, process. You have your presentation, whether it represents something and your audience, how are they perceiving it? Uh, is there an expectation? Is it a very objective view of what uh, has been presented to them. And like you said, the representation may be an imposition on something that they you know, necessarily um, want to uh, represent. And so for you, how did this uh, idea of identity uh, art come kind of more of interest to you? And you said if you were away from it, distance yourself from it for a while. Um. I, I'm, uh, again, I don't know if I'm more interested in it, but, but more that I just came to the realization that sort of resisting it is futile, mm -hmm. and that um, and that um, there's no neutral position to speak from. So you might as well sooner or later start to think about and sort of make a decision about where you where you stand. Is it to to, to, to resist identity politics altogether. So, because uh, that's assuming another sort of neutrality, right? Which is, which is fictional. Right? I mean, transnationalism, or this idea of transnational identity. But of course, I, I mean, there of course exists maybe 1% of the population who really flies around the world all the time and has convenes to live in multiple cities. But for most people, so they lived reality is very anchored in one place unless they're pushed by some external, external force. Um, so, so then you feel that it's, it's just of practicality that one has to, as an artist, think about these things. But then whether or not you sort of, as, as it were, sort of hold it up and call attention to it, that's an um, Yeah. Yeah, I think this idea that uh, it often involves a population that cannot move across the population of culture. Uh, it is something that is very, very hard to look at when there is a little person that is say, uh, maybe influencing what people see and what they talk about. Now, Bob, your, your work is uh, a little bit, comes from a different perspective from um, police and Primarily with uh, Asian American artists, um, that includes people with people of Chinese descent. Um, can you tell us about how the Asian American artists that 
whatever you can and what it's seeking to achieve by working with these artists? Um, we began the Asian American Art Center in 1974. Um, after Basement Workshop began, uh, which was one of the seminal uh, organizations on the East Coast to generate uh, for, uh, an, an Asian American activism in Chinatown, uh, where we were coming together doing the civil rights movement and also the anti-Vietnam war movement. And so another uh, number of Asian American students um, got together and uh, formed this uh, group called Basement Workshop. Uh, and out of that uh, came uh, our organization. We spun off from Basement in 74. Um, my wife was particularly looking at Asian American contemporary dance. And uh, I sort of was there, it eventually generated an interest in visual artists, uh, which um, we began sort of around 1980. By 82, we were, we were creating this archive. And in 83, we had our first exhibition with a number of artists in that show and a panel discussion um, in which we were talking about um, being an Asian American artist, uh, and uh, that 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 term Asian American was was generated in in basement workshop because specifically we were going to go out on the streets and have demonstrations and support our, in support of our community, and we needed a name to tell the press. So it wasn't the name that was commonly spoken of in Chinatown, which were mostly Toysan in those days. Uh, uh, and uh, the name for the people who lived in Chinatown was Tong Yen Gai, I mean Sweet People Street. But uh, to, the, to the press and to the government, we created this name called Asian American. It was changed to Asian Pacific Americans to include Samoans and Hawaiians. And uh, we dropped the hyphen after about six months. Um, and then that name became battered around, around the country and uh, by 1990 when the book came out called The Decade Show, um, the show was sponsored, that show was sponsored by the New Museum, the uh, Street Museum in Harlem and Mochata, the, the leading uh, Latino museum of gallery in New York City and that book was went all over the country in every art department saying that identity was the main thing uh, that happened for the last 10 years. <laughs> and that was what artists of color were all about. Uh, my organization had its identity show back in 86. So by that time, we thought identity was old hat and passe. But now suddenly it became the ruling thing that went on to be such an important element of the movement called multiculturalism, which was part of the major marketplace uh, of the arts for 20 years. Um, so we see presenting artists like Tom Hong Tu and other artists as, as helping, as, as you know, what, what I feel is an important goal, is to make a home for Asians in the United States. So that's why I'm sort of gave up the idea of, I, you know, I'm here, I'm not over there. And I'm therefore, I'm not concerned with the identity of, uh, I'm not directly concerned with the identity of, of Chinese and Chineseness. I'm concerned with um, how uh, we conceive of ourselves in the United States. And uh, that, that was sort of before you know, say Latino artists might fly back and forth to uh, the Caribbean or to you know Latin America, and uh, they they could understand themselves as being of both worlds. It wasn't until later, when uh, at, that, at that time when we were formulating ourselves, we were really looking at being in the United States um, and being part of this country. Now you might more readily see yourself
out as international and flying back and forth and uh, being an interna more of an international person rather than committing to an identity, um, a loyalty to one country or the other. Um, so I, th I think that that's how we saw Tom Hutu's work and many other artists, uh, whether they were largely concerned with China in their thematic of their work, or whether they were really looking at um, domestic issues of growing and living in, in a very American environment and watching a lot of TV American sitcoms and, um, and, and, and growing up with a lot of our friends who were maybe 97% of our friends were white in, 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 in our neighborhoods and you know, how do we live with them and how do they understand us who we are uh, and you know living in an urban area where half of our friends might be black or Latino or whatever, uh, or more than half. And how, how do we live in, in, in a very American environment uh, with all that America is trying to do in terms of what it is as the major military and political power in the world? Uh, should I mention the word hegemony? Um, and and how, how do we feel about living in such a country where they were coming back from Vietnam and calling us Greeks. How do we respond? So that's how I feel Asian American art is what, I'm, what I've been involved with. And uh, since you raised the topic of um, the Metropolitan Museum, uh, I, I don't know if you, you know, many people have received the formal letter that I sent to the Met. Uh, accusing them of racism, total planted out, out there, uh, re-establishing under the guise of, of, of presenting a story about uh, how the West uh, fantasized about China. That's, that's totally super uh, front to re-establish the, um, the stereotypes that they have been perpetuating us on us uh, for years and on China as well, not only as Asians here in the States. And uh, they are doing this uh, with other institutions. The Asian Art Museum in San Francisco did try to do this with the, the Geisha show in, I think it was 2005, and again the Samurai show in 2009, in which there was a, a large um, uh, resistance by the Asian American community out there, which they established a website which is very much active today, and a lot of American scholars contributed to criticize that museum for perpetuating these kinds of images. And then at the same time that this uh, fashion show at the Met was on, the Boston Museum gets into trouble with the um, when uh, the uh, uh, Kimono Wednesdays events, uh, where they also meet Asian American community resistance, and that community gets confronted by a lot of people from Japan and a lot of Japanese people here who don't understand an Asian American, even though they are <coughs> showing Hong Tu's work and and uh, Chen Kuang Chi's work downstairs. So, you know, th these are paradoxes that can live in your mind, you can enable you to have these different things in your life, but then they're making room in your head for these kinds of keeping Asians in that place. And I thought it's a very important question you raise of how do you present Asian and how, how do you present China today in the, in the mind what, what, what do you say to who's it for? If it's for Americans, you're concerned about who Chinese are to Americans and to the West, then you want to you want to make sure that this kind of mainstream creation of this Asian stereotype doesn't 
get a foothold in the mass of Americans' minds because that stereotype is the basis for what they did in Vietnam and what they're going to do in other Asian countries. To call us gooks, to call us exotic, I'm sorry, but th this is the basis for the destruction of a people, destruction of a culture. Uh, involved as well. And they also included um, examples of how uh, uh, traditional Chinese aesthetics would be shown in movies, um, either from the early 20th century, or even contemporary movies by uh, very famous directors uh, also want to show this sort of um, beautiful, fantastic image of uh, what China is. Um, would you say that having people from China or Asia contribute to this is contradictory to our interests? Not at all, because China has to buy in to the marketplace that the West has established in order to get the empty audience that it needs. It's playing an audience game, it's playing a market game. So therefore, they need to buy into those Western stereotypes in order to create a, a, a art, art and an image of China to get the audience that they need for their mass work. Um, Unfortunately, you know, the film, what I say in the end the letter, if you want to see it uh, to, the, to the man, is, is, is that um, even in China itself, there is a regulation that you can't tell the truth in the film, in the film industry. Uh, Western fantasies that have been perpetuated all over the world, you know, the gold mountain is, is, is Dominates the marketplace, so it does. It has. It has. Doesn't do anything to justify the show to say that the uh, Chinese did it too. Look what they did to uh, uh, Hannah Mae Wong. You know, she couldn't kiss that guy on on screen because there was a regulation in Hollywood that no Asian can kiss any white guy. In the public. <laughs> so you know that those films are made to be to make money in the Western marketplace, not just the Chinese marketplace. Now, Samson, along these lines, you, you said uh, regarding Asian composers that they've demanded the previous generation of Asian composers demanded the world's attention to self-organize it. It became local performance, it was easy to put on a performative masquerade of Israel's when the world was watching, but it is not always up to you to take it on from the audience and become so fixed. Um, but uh, the current generation of Asian countries um, have been able to become recognized as artists in their own right. And what do you think has helped change that perception or expectation? Uh, I mean, of course, it's different times now, and and I think um, there's been a lot of advances in the discourse in the last two or three decades. So um, people are more sensitive to the fact that treating artists of, who are from a particular place as local informants and are not, are not they are saying the right thing to do. Um, but paradoxically, I think, um, and I, I totally agree with Bob about the, the, this, is, this idea of, of resistance and, and, and how the idea of China, although it's very fussy around the edges, is still a place to resist from, uh, precisely because, I mean, just look at why we have on this panel and like we, we have a very persistent and um, relentlessly persistent um, uh, perhaps it is something that is so so central to sort of our existence and how we see ourselves that for, I mean that's one possibility it's an issue that's perhaps never going to go away or maybe we've been trying to be constructive in the wrong way um, 
And, and then the, the, thing, the thing is, when, I mean, what do you replace it with? I have personally never seen a truly transnational like artist or composer or coffee barrister or whatever, you know? And like, where is that transnational want to be found, truly? Really? And so, um, what would you expect from a transnational artist? Um, I don't know. I haven't seen it, so. I don't know what to see. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but but the quotation, like the, the quote that you um, that you uh, cited, I I actually didn't mean that as a criticism. Like, there's no value judgment in that. It's just like my observation of how. Like a generation of uh, you know of composers specifically, I was talking about um, sort of creative way um, for their own work to be seen, um, and then there's there's nothing wrong or anything about sort of performing identity. Um, I mean, you can flip that whole notion of performing and think about it as a creative misreading. I mean, do we really know sort of ourselves and sort of the place that we are from? And if we can't claim to truly know, then always what we are doing is like creatively misreading like what we think, you know? Right? And so if you think about it, maybe talk about your experience. But at what point did you feel like you changed? I think that, uh, as an artist, <clears throat> From art, this point of view, uh, I'm interested you know, to to mix my East, my past life experience, and my new life in uh, high and low. But I, I like to work in between to the Lord's boundaries. Um, but uh, as a person you now, uh, moved from China to here, uh, when I was already Almost 40 years old. Automatically, I like to compare what's America, what's China. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is not only me. Many, many of my uh, Chinese friends, uh, similar generation, they also compare. Maybe different results, but uh, people compare. So in, the, in this case, sometimes uh, the similar situ situation, but uh, maybe I have different. Uh, Attitude to, to deal with. Um, for example, now um, I have two, two, two examples about uh, my work being censored. Why is it censored over here? The public organizer shows about uh, uh, one year memory of memory of of Cambridge, 1990. Uh, three hours of work censored from the show. The show was uh, uh, originally. Uh, showing at uh, Washington DC, Russell Rotunda, supposed to be the government running space. Uh, the reason for my work is censored because they said my work that at last banquet is uh, with, with offense religious people. Okay, this is a nightmare. I was expecting some, something to happen from Chinese government, but the American government censored my work before Chinese government. But, since uh, people like Babli, like many people, they will really fight for Asian Americans' right, human right, uh, right to you know, express, express themselves. So when Bob said, okay, Bob's is not in the show, but uh, uh, Bob's ideas were not were, were, were withdrawn from the show. Uh, around around how many hours, 100 hours, all Store. So this, this show only, uh, even the catalog of publishing uh, didn't give to the, uh, to the audience. So this is happened at the same time with censorship. My, my feeling was very strong, okay, here I got censored, but also here people support me. And, uh, <clears throat> and the result, result is totally different. In China, even today, you be censored the government you die. But over here, after censorship, my, my work is getting more publicity. <laughs> my American friend even ask me, can I, can I do something with George Bush? Huh? To, to, to make some publicity.
So that's different. So my parents also go compare. So if this space, this uh, environment allow me to con to continue my work, I stay here. I don't I don't care about market. I don't care the financial the economic situation. How how good in China? Now that's many people. Uh, that's the same reason for many people they move back to China. When Bob talked about the, the, the recent math show, the fashion show, uh, I also same, uh, had a different uh, re reaction with, with Bob. Bob is a fighter. Bob is a, <laughs> a definitely going to, uh, onto, uh, that's government, that's the power, that's authority to know. There's Asian people. We have, we, we have the equal opportunity, equal right with all other people. Uh, that's really helped a lot of other people. But as artists, when I heard this show, immediately I thought, okay, next time I can put this show in my method, in my resume. That's what I thought. Hmm. So I, I didn't care if, the, if my work, actually, my, my, not my own work, is cooperative with the living time. Mm -hmm. I don't really care downstairs, upstairs, upstairs. Uh, also, I thought, I, I know, if there's something wrong, then Bob will affect me. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob sent a letter to a to, to, to lot of people. I read the letter, but I didn't respond to it. I know he will continue to do it. <laughs> and also, why I said I compare with China? Because the same work, well, I just, uh, the same work I've done in 1994, actually. That's, all, that's more than 20 years ago. Until today, I have no chance to show in China. Even way when I read her book, into China was, was banned by the custom office. This, this situation still happened today. But the Met, good, Metropolitan Museum going to show this kind of work is already different with the Chinese government. And also compared with 30, 20 years ago, Met, even Asian market, uh, Asian, Asian society, is also big different. Uh, many of these kind of uh, uh, institutions start to pay more attention to contemporary Chinese art. Even, uh, even the art does not really uh, belong to the so-called mainstream. So this kind of situation made me a uh, little bit um, feel complicated. What am I going to do? But that, I don't need to stand with, you know, with a bad set. But as far as I'm more concerned about how to continue my work. If nobody bothers me, this one I can do. That one I cannot do. I'm just narrative unfold with these three gentlemen just now and we could walk around the corner to Gagosian and see Dong Fang Zhe's mega show and then you could walk over a block to Pace and see Zhang Huang's mega show and it's a curious thing. I have to always reference the fact that there's been a truly profound influx of money into a scene that started out with some very different integrity, I, I dare say. This is my own perspective, and I want to remain humble and reverent of the bounty of history that China affords us as human beings. We share a human history. So when you consider the legacy of the Chinese people and the civilization and the culture, the mind that we understand through the art itself, that's a, a beautiful thing to witness. So whether it's the ancient context that is recapitulated for blockbuster shows at the Met or the kind of uh, titillation of the thing that we see here in Chelsea, the hub of the American art market in New York, right here in this neighborhood. It, we're literally surrounded by it. But the themes, the themes I think endure. I, I, was curious to note from having gone to those two shows today, in fact, 
the, the John Juan show is over a thousand characters, a thousand human beings in this painting that stretches across two walls and created with Buddhist detritus, the, 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 the detritus, the actual ashes from Buddhist temples. And he's been doing that work for a while, so you have again this confluence of stuff going on. I'm not sure I'm answering this question very well. I'm really thinking a lot about what Samson and Bob and, and John Hong Tu have been, been discussing, and I, I always want to recognize that I bring a, a certain perspective as it relates to my own passion and study of Chinese history and culture and the art. And then, of course, working in the, the capitalist. Uh, I, I can't separate it, I, uh, you know, 资本家, <laughs> a lot of capitalist rotors these days. So we, we just have to recognize there, there are these levels to it, right? So what are the Chinese artists grappling with now? I think a lot of them are trying to do what's expected of them. Uh, to get a show at Pace or to get a big show at the Goshen, there's an expectation. The work has to look a certain way. And I, I'm aware of that. I think most of us who've been seeing this art evolve in the last 40 years, are, are, we're very aware of that as well. It, it seems like you've drawn a, a pretty sharp distinction between the commercial market and what uh, maybe grassroots artists do um, in, in the areas that Bob works in. Uh, should there be more discussion and overlap between those two spaces? Well, thank you. I've always felt that the art world, this, this art, this incredible overarching thing that we're doing, which is art, right? We're doing art here. We're talking about art. That, I believe, art at its most valuable in the progression, in the whole timeline of human history, it is a conversation. It's objects, it's creativity, it's a certain magic, right? We're literally pulling ideas out of thin air, reifying them, manifesting them into physical objects. But that inspires a dialogue. And that inspires an opportunity to look beyond this life to something else that's happening. Beauty, the sublime, I dare say, these are the, the, the highest moments of human, the, the human experience. It's something that allows for transcendence. So I, I think that great art and the work of great artists is the attempt to, to sort of transcend, uh, at the same time create the dialogue, the opportunity for the discussion. Again, I don't think I've answered the question, but thank you for the opportunity to, to riff a little bit on what, what I think it is we're, we're circumambulating. It's this idea of the conversation. Um, Bob, do you think there should be more conversations with uh, the commercial side of the world? I think I, I, what, I, what I've said before is that um, I'm, I'm really involved with uh, Asian American art and trying to uh, focus on artists that reflect what's happening as we as, as people living in the States evolve and which artists create things that that to me says something about who we who we are, how we're changing, and how that work reflects um, what I see as being Asian and Asian American. Um, so therefore, I was never concerned about um, the marketplace. I was uh, relying on government funding, even though that was like minuscule. That enabled us to continue what we were doing and, and knowing that. I had to do an archive because we were, in those days, 2% of the population and there was hardly any audience. And so that the archive would be able to speak to people later uh, about what, what, how Asian American art evolved. And so we knew that from the get-go, that that's what we were focused on. Um, now, at a certain point, in 1992 actually, to 93, um, which I know is before, uh, when you got involved, um, the Chinese art market got recognized in the United States, um, and suddenly the Rockefeller collection was put aside at Asia Society, and they 
jumped into uh, Asian American contemporary art, and they jumped into international Asian art um, um, to try to show that uh, they 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 followed the IBM gallery that had the first contemporary, I believe, uh, major catalog um, contemporary. Japanese artists in Japan, about five or six artists were shown. And so that was the first taste the American public got that Asia was no longer this antiquated thing. But there was new things happening in Asia. Just, even though there were so many contemporary art things happening in uh, the American public had no wind of it. Suddenly the market opens up, uh, this new next wave Asian art in the Western marketplace, and a lot of Americans used to wonder how come suddenly um, this took place in the marketplace. So um, at that point, we're still doing what we do, and we still continue to do what we do. But the American public is, and the, the buying public, the, mar the art marketplace, is, is very much involved with Chinese artists in China, and Chinese artists who reflect China here. And uh, pretty soon, you know, I think there was talk about the Indian marketplace, how that went up and down and now we've been coming again uh, in India. So uh, what's happening on the domestic field here and how that overlaps with the international art market, um, that, you know, so I'm not involved with that. Uh, I feel that anything you can do in that sphere and the other sphere where there's a, I've exhibited over a thousand people, most of that thousand people have never seen the fruits of the an art market. That, they live in that world. The art market lives in this world. Anything you do in either one of these places that helps China find itself, find who they are in this world, and, and be able to bring the magnificent uh, of Chinese culture to the world, and um, and um, make make its compromise with the world that the West has created. Um, maybe I shouldn't use that word compromise. Uh, they're, they're, these things can coexist, and they they need to find the relationship aside from this demand for power, whether it's economic or military. Um, it's, China is important. I know I touch upon that in what in what I'm doing, uh, so I feel that this is an important discussion and what. What those artists that you talk about, who who know that they have to make something that's going to be a hit over in that venue, they can still do something of value. And this this idea of coexisting in the Eastern West is there a dichotomy that makes it difficult for the two to come together? And if they do come together, how do they do so? Is it to um, first have a compromise, or can we exist completely as themselves and uh, find ways to respect each other's uh, cultures and spheres? I don't know if anybody can answer this. And it's a difficult question. I, I think there's, there's certainly a lot of uh, culture and history that is very difficult to convey bring over to China and the East. Um, but I, I was I'm curious about this, uh, back to the idea of the imagery that um, men portray. And we'll, we'll do this very quickly. Um, Samsung, you, you've, you've had a work, a series called, uh, you did, um, Elements or 
situations. You can, you can, you can situations. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and uh, one example was a string quartet playing, uh, but not actually making sounds. And the other part of it was uh, you had line dancers perform without having any music or percussion, uh, if it works. Uh, so there is some element that's identifiably Chinese. At what point can something be recognized as a universal culture without having all the elements there? Um, um, I mean, that's a good question, but I don't know if I was thinking about that question. Mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking about that? With the, I, was, I mean, the, the premise of the, the piece is just to find some situations that usually would be very loud and have multiple layers of sounds, but to reveal not the loudest layer, like to mute the loudest layer. So like the, I think with the Latin dance I came to it just because it, it's just a very noisy component, but then if you take away all the percussions, then you hear the line dance get rattling and uh, the, the steps and the dancers are uh, moving um, with. And, and so I, I think it, um, it wasn't so much about, I mean, uh, there were other, like there are altogether 20 situations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I guess the materials for those situations are just things that I know are now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question, but I'd like to go back to your... No, it, it's, it's, no, it's, um, well, there's no misinterpretation, it's how we see it. Um, but, like, your earlier question is interesting. Like, sort of, how do we, how do we coexist, right? I mean, um, but, but I guess that, that isn't so different to how we have always asked that question not just in the context of quote unquote East versus West, just how we coexist with each other, right? And um, somebody once said that I was good, and also most of I listen, I was good, also this author in philosophy who writes a lot um, of sort of, um, does a lot of fictional um, works where you would have one situation, but unfolding or being described in the consciousness of many other characters, many different characters. Um, and, and somebody once said that um, the, the abiding lesson of Iris Murdoch Dog is the importance and the difficulty of under, understanding other consciousness and sort of what they are thinking. Um, but that's the thing, right? There's always, you know, when you try to approach that question, there's always essentialization, right? I assume this is what you think, I assume this is what you are, and it goes both ways, right? So there's essentialization of, of China or whatnot. There's also essentialization of America, of uh, of both of the West. And, and so, um, but we just, yeah, and, but we keep trying. That's sort of what we know, right? Mm -hmm. And. Um, I don't even know where I'm going with this, but I think I, I, I thought I thought like when you when you said that I thought um, yeah just not just stop trying and it's trying to understand that that they are other consciousness and that they are peculiar and that they are strange that that's the, the best thing that we can do. It comes from our understanding and also recognition of place in the world in society. Um, I can, can I just yes I think that. Um, we seem, like, we seem like we're talking about China and the United States and all these other things in here. Uh, actually, you know, is there a compromise? Inside of us are many, many people, and all these things exist inside us. The China in us, the U.S. in us, all these things, it's all in here. And, and how do we reconcile those things? How do we compromise with ourselves inside? How do we find who we are? be. Um, and uh, it's very hard because all these words and all these metaphors, all these concepts have been, <laughs> have been uh, uh, created this world that we, this 
crazy world that we live in. Uh, and, and so artists have to try to find a way to help us come to peace with ourselves. And, uh, and Sanford has created a fascinating body of work that's now on exhibit here in New York City in which the, the metaphors of the military and how the military function and how music functions and how all the sounds that we hear around us can speak to us and, 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 and bring us back to and really say something useful to us. Um, in creating that kind of metaphor, he's helping us to put together the world that's inside of us. So, it, and, and, and then, and then maybe we'll be able to compromise to find some central thing where all these paradoxes are okay with each other. So, um, here he is, he's an artist right here. Part of you helping us to resolve these Bay issues, but they're right, they're, they're just right here inside us. And, and that, I like think, this idea that um, artists reconcile uh, what's going on with their own identity in the society around them. The country is uh, something that we should all think about when we look at artworks from artists of Chinese descent because it's a very diverse, complicated field. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, so I think we can open up the floor of questions from the audience. And we've had a strong discussion here. It's covered a lot of areas. Yes, I have a question. As um, it appears that the balance of power changes, how do people on the panel see their artwork or the kinds of artwork they are looking for? changing as the balance of power seems to be changing. In the change of the society or change of yourself? Between between the East and the West. Mm. I think that as an artist you also give it to other. You're not you're not artist you can close the door now giving yourself. But in the same time you have to keep uh, honest to yourself. The society, the environment, the reality always change. But if you have something like a principle or something now uh, from your your true love, you really like, you really want to do, that's the, to me that's the mo motivation. That's the thing now uh, to attract me to continue my work. And also easier to uh, uh, to continue because you don't have to you you are not bothered by something surrounding. Mm, that's that's generally uh, I think that's uh, how to say it. that's like a like a global issue, like an international issue. It's not only Chinese issue. Any kind of society, it will be it it also some something uh, uh, want to want, want to change you want to now. Uh, attract you to go to different directions, either market or museum or of the curator, critique. Everybody they consider, okay, uh, they consider the relationship between them and the artist. I think more importantly, artists have to con consider yourself. I have more like a comment than a question. I just think. Talisman works for the Met, you will see more Chinese contemporary there, would it be? <laughs> and to Robert's point, I think, I think the Mets, you know, that costume institute exhibit, I'm not bothered by it. The reason is, it's a costume show. And, and the Met is it's more of an encyclopedic museum. I think if you look at it in that light, uh, from that angle, it's really pretty remarkable Hongzhu's work is even in it at all. I think if you look at it in that regard. Um, so I, I'm not, I have a different view, I'm not bothered by that at all. As long as the exhibit presents China in a favorable light, um, I'm just totally not bothered by that type of exhibit. It is definitely a prompted discussion, because we're having now an officer to various things that are helps our discussion about whether this is. Uh, yeah, 
and uh, I understand it, what would you mean, but I still think uh, yeah. people like Bob, we need these kind of people. Yeah, more, that part I understand, <laughs> yeah. yes. More, yeah. more will be better, because right. for any big museum, any big institution, they have to hear a different voice. That's the only way to make them now uh, go ahead. The only way to make them develop something. Right. So if nobody criticizes them, you'll never get to it. Yeah. Yes. Can I comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you talk about food in the kitchen, how nice, you know. It's just food. Mm -hmm. Well, these are just costumes. How nice. You know, I think uh, at Samson's exhibition, he talked about how the Pentagon got a bunch of artists together uh, to work as a, a, an entity. And I forgot, it was some kind of false thing. They would create battles and something like this to distract the enemy that, that where the real battle is. And these were all artists who were hired, I don't know, for how many years creating these things. I never heard about it except when I went to the show. Uh, that's part of a military campaign, how these artists are doing that. Those, those costumes are part of a military campaign that is against Asians who are going to get killed because we didn't pay attention to how it affects the American public's idea of who we, these slant eyes, are. Yeah, I have to say, uh, not for the negative reason, but I have difficulty with it. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because I think that at this moment in history, certainly has changed over the last 40 years in all respects in relation to Asians and Asian art. And we have to begin to, I think, uh, open up a real dialogue where, you know, we're not hating and we're not disliking that we're really seeing the positive side of who we are and what we're doing. And I think that's also necessary and positive. I like very much some of your remarks, uh, Allison, in relation to the spirit of art, which is very, very rarely talked about now. But this is something we all share as human beings, for sure. And that should be the common ground. In terms of this Met show, it's a spectacle. And there are spectacles that we deal with constantly. Every day is just one more spectacle that's disguising the truth. So what? Okay? We have to separate the media, we have to separate the money from the art, and we have to take the art and make it something that is part of our humanity, part of our tradition, distill that humanity into something that is positive and worthy of our time and energy and to move with it. I think we have a possibility to do that now. But we have to recognize that these things are not so important to obsess us, that we have to go in a much more positive direction in terms of how we think. So I have a comment in the question. I know that it's hard to say it first. <laughs> My comments, actually, I, I didn't really see um, there's a balance of power. So I can see the marketplace that we're dealing with all these kind of flamboy artists coming from mainland China. And Bob, you're dealing with some kind of grassroots kind of artists. And I think that both I need to coexist. And actually, we already talked about all this kind of possibility. And without those both spectrum, you won't see anything that comes in between. But we need to fight for it. We need to also address the, all this existing to be here and to be for us to um, really think about what we're doing as an artist. And of course, like Hong Kong is already being another kind of Asian city, but it's a China already come across it's a lot of uh, identity crisis or nationalistic kind of a theory that they need to come across and solve the problem. So we are not coming and solve the problem, but I think to get awareness of it, even though the match show, what we're doing, the marketplace, or others kind of new immigrants and artists are working here, it actually is all that form, or even though the artists who are in the 60s, so I just do a show of artists coming here, they're all born in the 60s. So that every situation, every generation are giving us a hint about how we form ourselves. And in evolution, we are not giving any kind of conclusion, but it's evolution of what we're doing now. So um, I'm really kind of, really happy to hear to see that 
all the spectrum that we have actually uh, discussing tonight. I have a question. Is, uh, is art uh, based on a nation or where you come from, or is art art? And do we have to discuss art in terms of national identity? Or can we view art as a human identity, as, as a people identity? Because to me, I, I went with Jung Hong Tu to South Africa, and Jung Hong Tu was embraced as, a, as an artist. And when he went to Soweto, he saw a place that looked like where he came from. And uh, do we have to continue to, to talk like this as, uh, about nations, or can we talk about art as uh, curatorial categories? Because, uh, so. And I agree with the tenants of the continent. Um, there's two different ways to look at it. There's the Jewish group. You have more opportunity to travel to, to, to everything about each other. So <clears throat> in this case, actually, if we find the, the things we can share in common, or we can make dialogue, we can discuss, it's more important than your clue on your own background. Of course, your own background gives you some inspiration to your work. Maybe it's unique. But, the, but, the, but since you have this kind of opportunity to reach more people to reach more different culture. So, so something universal also become part of your, your heart, inside your, 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 your heart. It's so not as a, as a virus. For example, if I, if I talk about, if people talk with me about the Impressionism now 30 years ago, I thought, oh wow, this is French stuff. Mm -hmm. Now I can go to Magic College to say the best Impressionism paintings. So, uh, <clears throat> So that's why I also uh, emphasize my work. It is, it is related to my Chinese background. I use the motif, uh, the subject matter from my life experience in China. But while doing on my art, I'm, from my personal feeling and personal ideas, so I can criticize it. I can, I can make something beauty. I can make some, I can, Tell people something behind the beauty is ugly. So in this kind of way, I think I am more afraid of. I don't have to only to represent in Chinese culture, or uh, even not only represent myself, because myself is not is no longer only belong to my own Chinese tradition. So I thought now if if this kind of panel we can also can expand to to next level. Thank you. Can I respond to him? Oh, sure. Okay. I think this is overlapping, you see, the, the national issues, is China, how do we present China, but it's overlapping with art and the, the thing we all share is the, this hum, humanity, cultures that create really cultures centered around our human uh, nature, our human exist, existence. So those, those, those things overlap and we hope that one doesn't take over the other and, and you know, that we are trying to create a balance. You know, I feel like I hope I didn't do what Robert Morgan suggested and become off too negative. I really am totally involved in, in, in what you said about this immense 5,000 year history of humanity and we can go to these shows and, and open up to this wonderful story, this wonderful message that, that's out there if we can tune into it. Um, and to find it here, where you know these big galleries, but also find it in small communities, locations, and, and see um, how these things ring a bell for us. How do how do they mean for us, and generate in ourselves, you know, um, who we who we want to be. If I may also comment, Canon. Thanks for your lovely.
comment, and especially about having shared that very personal experience with John Hong Tu and the reverberation of the place we were together that was reminiscent of where he's from. In, in my own experience, having spent some time in China, it was very humbling to recognize at the end of the day all these white women over there. Uh, I was often just floored by the kindness that the people demonstrated to me in every capacity. And then even this moment of, of our talking about this stuff, and I'm a white woman on this panel, <laughs> I have this experience with Chinese art, but we're, we're, we really are sharing this life and this global history, and it's a privilege and an honor to be involved in what we're doing as a humanity. So without sounding too utopian, but in the spirit of, of, of Buddhist oneness, it is really uh, just a glorious thing to have so many perspectives on the same thing. So thanks for your beautiful human comment. I, I completely agree that art should be seen as something universal and not simply be seen through the lens of nationality. I, I completely agree with that. But one concern is that if, I, I personally think, if no context is given to the art, especially if it comes from a completely different culture, um, there's a risk that that art will be completely misunderstood as well. So what, what is your take on that? What is your opinion on In a communist country, which is, uh, you have now 
this kind of freedom to practice your religious. That's also true. When I came here, of course, I'm still like another. But after a while living in this country, especially after I moved to Queens, now Woodside, I find that, okay, that's America. My neighbor is uh, all speak different languages. My, my English is very bad, but I also can find somebody even worse. <laughs> so that made me feel, mm, okay, <laughs> this is America now. And, uh, and uh, talk about art, I do the same thing. Because of my background, uh, I'm interested in different cultures, like Canon uh, said, I'm in South America, uh, uh, Stovito, I feel, I feel I'm, I'm part of them. So I can take the, uh, the taxi you now, only for people, for black people, from the downtown, go to Soviet. I can do that. Now I need white people in second uh, Even now, I need to Uh In this case, now, it's not, not a, I'm not encouraged everybody to do the same. But personally, I thought that I can be living, I can, I can live in a different cultural environment. That's only made me feel, um, only made me, now, uh, give me opportunity to learn more. So, uh, but I'm not, I'm, I don't tell people everybody to do that because you have a different background, you have different life experience, you can do, you can do totally different art. That's, no, nothing different. No, no, nothing no, uh, to compare which is good, which is bad. I just do myself. People do, can do anything they want, depending on their. Can I just follow up on that? Uh, Hongju is telling you that, you know, that's only your tail. Uh, there are other people who tell you it's your head, it's your heart, it's your, you know, it's more. And uh, there are people out there who will provide a context for the art that you see. There's new things that are being created you've never seen before. And it, it really, it, you really need a context to give it meaning. And so when you look at something new, do you, do you understand that that's just your tale? Or, do you, or, or, do you, or someone who has interpreted it for you, saying it's your, something else, in, you know, who's, that's part of you. And so the, the people who are provided context, whether it's curators who, who write something about it and give it an interpretation, or whether it's a, a big gallery or a big institution like the Met that provides an interpretation for what you're seeing, you need to listen here and, and see that this is a helpful interpretation or whether it's, it's not helpful interpretation. So the artist creates something, like Samson created this amazing new metaphor for us to find a new way to think about things, or whether it's somebody who's, who's going to give you a, a, a context within which to see what he's creating. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody on the panel. I think we've had a very interesting discussion that's covered a lot of different grounds. Um, so, yeah, thank you for my singular.